Thank you for the info. <laughs> sure, it'd be great. Thanks for the info. Man. You got it. Baby. Thank you. All right, behave yourself up here. I'll try my best. So, uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. It's always exciting for me to come to um, the Power Athlete Symposium because it's kind of like a family reunion. Get a chance to see so many people that I haven't seen in a while. But th this morning, I'd like to start off with a somewhat of a serious topic. There is a rumor going around that Dr. Tom is a comic book geek. And you know, I'm not the type of person that likes to support labels and stereotypes. I'm thinking just because I wore the official <laughs> Infinity Gauntlet shirt, just because I walk around with the Invicta signature Captain America watch, that doesn't mean I'm into comic books. So let's not stereotype people anymore. Let's let people be who they are, okay? Can everyone agree with me that that's all right? So uh, I will be doing a presentation with the watch on. Um, anyway, this morning I thought it would be uh, kind of cool in light of the uh, new trailer, Endgame, from uh, Avengers Infinity. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is a lot of cool stuff, stuff that's uh, really dare to me. Um, I was not originally going to talk about cancer, but it seems like that's all I get asked questions on for the most part anymore. So I'm going to lead off uh, with a few things about that. And maybe uh, next slide, please. And so um, uh, a while ago, we had set a goal. And uh, I didn't really think the goal was that big, honestly. I just was watching all these people suffering from, with cancer. And I thought, man, the way things are being done is just stupid. There was all this money generated. And despite all the money generated for research, there's no test that's really that accurate with cancer. Right now, anywhere in the world, there is no test that gets down to zero cancer cells. So you got all these centers that have generated billions of dollars and collectively trillions of dollars. How is it that after all this money has been raised, no one knows what they're doing? It's hard to convince anyone that there was a real purpose or cause behind all that revenue being uh, generated or that money being raised. So we set this goal and it was just to eliminate cancer as a threat to the future mankind. And it was kind of more of like, um, yeah, you know, this is something that we wanted to start sharing with people. And more and more people started hearing and go, wow, that's pretty fucking cool. That's pretty, you know, mind-blowingly awesome. And I'm like, really? I just saw people that were suffering that I knew needed help. And that's kind of how I was uh, approaching it. I wasn't really thinking about the greater ramifications of the statement. Next slide, please. So um, what I thought I would share is this is, uh, you know, somewhat boring statistical data. But I, I think it makes the, the point very, very clearly. So. Because it's a little bit smaller, I had to reformat things and get them into this presentation. I'm going to kind of walk you through. So basically, 1973, 1975, this green box all the way across the most recent data for this presentation is 2013. So over 30-something years, 40-something years, depending upon the exact time they're collecting the data, that's the number of new cancer cases. So pretty much. There's, there's so many new cancer cases coming out um, every year. Oh, sure. Sorry. Thank you. If you compare that now to the yellow, which is the number of deaths, what you start to see is there's no impact. After almost 40 years of all the drugs, all the radiation, all the different allegations of, hey, we're winning a war against cancer, there's no impact. What is happening is they're improving the ability to detect and discover cancer earlier. The sad part, the unfortunate part, people with pancreatic cancer, people with lung cancer, they won't know they have cancer until it's stage four because it's largely asymptomatic. You don't know, you know, I'm coughing and, oh, that's cancer. You're thinking of some other things, maybe pollutants in the air or something. Now let's take a look at the, uh, the blue bars is the... Um, Median household income, so roughly over about 40 years, the uh, average income in the United States hasn't changed. What has changed is compression. So if we were to somehow look at the range of income, what you see is more people would be at the very bottom and more people would be at the very top, and there'd be almost no one in the center. And that's, now if you average that out, it kind of looks like almost its level. And then now if you look at the cost of drugs. So, if you look at the data very clearly, you'd see in 1983, insurance companies said, hey, we're not doing it the way we used to do it anymore. Insurance used to cover everything. Now, around 1983, they said, hey, we're going to now have all these restrictions. 
pre-existing medical conditions, medical necessity, all these new terms that today everybody knows, but back then no one even knew what the hell that meant. And essentially it's their way of justifying if they're gonna cover something or not. But you have to remember insurance is a for-profit you know, business model. So they're not gonna have more money leaving than coming in. So now they have all these restrictions on what is being covered and what's not being covered. The ramifications of that is right around 1990, 1995, you start seeing exponential uh, increases in the cost of cancer drugs. So now, <clears throat> you don't even have to know what you're looking at, but if I was to ask anyone here, which column represents drug prices, <laughs> it should be pretty obvious it's the tallest one, right? So drug companies today make billions and billions of dollars, and the main point what you see here is there's no impact. So even though they're making more money than ever, there's no impact overall. Now, yeah, they're going to market, hey, we did this, and hey, we did that, and it sounds really good until someone takes the time to look at the actual data and they go, wow, I'm being lied to right now and all these ads on TV and all this stuff. So if we can um, uh, go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So this uh, slide's a bit dated, 2017, but 4,630 new cancer cases every day. That's every single day, thousands of new cases, and you got about one-third of uh, those cancer cases. So you basically, one third of the people that are diagnosed with cancer, they're going to die. They're going to die because they're gonna have just a lot of misinformation being applied to them. They're going to get the wrong drugs, sometimes unintentionally, it's just an accident, sometimes intentionally. They're getting drugs that will never work, but it makes the center a lot of money. And I'm gonna show you what Mayo Clinic themselves have shared since 2012, and most people are, don't, aren't aware of the, the strategy. But um, you see the slide there, or, or the data point, 2015, $107 billion spent globally on cancer drugs. At $100 million per year, so whether you're an individual or company, you can influence the economy of any country in the world, including the United States. So when you have a company that's doing 107, or sorry, companies collectively doing $107 billion, the financial muscle they have is an act bias anything they want to their position. And, and think about this, um, you know, Gatorade is considered a food legally. Artificial chemicals, artificial coloring, but somehow that's a food. That just gives you an example of the impact of lobbying. You could make up new laws to justify what you want to have achieved. So in the case of drug companies, they now impact medical school. So every bright mind in the world today that goes to medical school is learning that, hey, when there's a problem, Drugs, when there's another problem, more drugs. So they're not learning about exercise and nutrition. So when companies like mine come along or my team, you know, and we say, well, we have a physical therapist and a strength coach for cancer patients, they think we're quacks because exercise can't possibly help anyone that has cancer. And of course they're wrong, they just don't know they're wrong. So now if we go to the next slide, please. Thanks. <clears throat> This is a huge problem, and this is a quote from Mayo Clinic in 2012. The current payment model in the United States is not sustainable, and that reimbursement for medical care should be tied to discrete measurable metrics that reflect improved outcomes for a population. What they're basically saying is the health, an insurance-based healthcare model doesn't work. Why is that? Because someone else is determining what you're going to get access to, not you. Every person here would like the right to decide what is going into their body or what therapies or treatments are done to them. But now we have this concept of medical necessity. It's not you as the patient, it's not your doctor who you should have a close relationship with, it's somebody else that doesn't know either one of you that's determining, hey, whether this stuff will be covered or not. And so what's happening right now, the business interests are exceeding the patient results. So imagine your mom or dad is in a hospital and they're you know, suffering, and some knucklehead say, oh yeah, we're gonna do this drug regimen for this cancer, and what if you knew that the regimen was wrong? It won't matter, they have to still do it anyway. So hardly makes any sense at all, but that is welcome to the standard of care model, and this is worldwide, it's not just the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So I um, apologize the links I clicked on, so you know they got the hyperlink colors, so the blue on black, I apologize. I like to tell people I'm colorblind, because if you see all the colors I wear, normally you re you'll get it. Um, so uh, what I wanted people to see, a lot of times you know, when we're in the United States, we have this like uh, bias. You know, we kind of forget, hey, there's a whole rest of the world out there. 
And so this is stuff from Australia that was showing, and, and the United Kingdom showing that in other countries, at major hospitals, people are getting the wrong drugs and they're dying. And that's a pretty big concern because, you know, one of the number one reasons people die in medicine is um, the, wrong, the wrong treatment was being administered. And so this is, um, you know, uh, reference material that's out there from different news media, news reports about one of the largest hospitals in Sydney, Australia, 70 cancer patients being treated. They receive significantly less than the recommended dose of a chemotherapy drug. So even let's assume the drugs were correct for their diagnosis, they got too little. Then another place is the United Kingdom, 10,000 cancer patients were given the wrong drugs. So now when someone says, oh, there's no cure for cancer, what it tells me is they're not really aware of what actual problems are. Cancer is not a single, um, it's like not a single cell type of thing. Um, the, the, the evolution of our understanding of cancer is this. Years ago, if I had cancer, it didn't matter if it was brain or breast or prostate or colon, a solid tumor cancer or a blood-based cancer, it was just cancer, one label. And doctors at that time would watch people come in and they would try their best and everyone would die. So the, the bias effect of that, the visual impact is like cancer is this big bad enemy and nothing we have works against it. So that led to this process of developing these chemotherapeutic agents. And the chemotherapeutic agents are brutal. They don't just kill cancer cells, they kill a lot of other healthy cells as well. Uh, the radiation procedures that are done, they don't just kill cancer cells. In some cases, they also kill uh, healthy cells, so they set up the stage for new cancers decades later. But that was better than doing nothing and watching people you love or care about die. So then, as time went on, I started saying, wait a minute, a brain cancer is not all the same. You could have a glioblastoma, you could have another type of cancer where something from the body metastasized into the brain, and you could have prostate cancer in the brain. And so now they realized, wait a minute, so not all, can no, not all cancers in the body are the same, but there's a limitation. The cancers are diagnosed based on geography. So if it's in my lungs, it's a lung cancer. If it's in my brain, it's a brain cancer. And it's still not accurate enough to really define what it is that we're fighting. So then further research was done, and now they started finding that, okay, now we have all these different types of lung cancers, all these different types of breast cancers and so forth. And the treatments that were being developed, the reason why they weren't gonna work is because one type of breast cancer may have a, be positive for an estrogen receptor. Another type of breast cancer is not positive for an estrogen receptor. So if I have estrogen-based drugs, right, then I'm gonna not help the people that don't have those receptors. So then as of 2017, using more robust methods called liquid biopsies, they now have discovered that even within a single person, the cancer cells are different. So now, when you listen to a company saying, we're gonna try to fight the cure for cancer, it makes absolutely no sense, right, their approach where how are you going to have a single cure when even within a given individual, all the cancer cells can be different? So there's incredible um, lack of awareness between people doing research and actually what the solution has to be in order to win the war. So I share this with you because you're not going to read about it anywhere. No one's going to tell you about it. It takes someone that's really digging in deep that has, uh, you know, the, uh, the savageness of a pit bull that's going crazy to defend something and the tenacity that I'm never giving up. I will die first before I give up. That's what it's going to take to change this. And uh, part of our vision long term is we will treat cancer for free. And that's how we will disrupt cancer oncology medicine globally. So next slide, please. So um, just some more, you know, links that show that drug errors are common all over the world with treating cancer. Uh, things as simple as, you know, the settings on a radiation machine are wrong, so someone doesn't get the right dose, uh, different drugs being administered either at the wrong time or in the wrong quantities. I think that kind of makes it clear. I don't have to keep beating that one. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, we'll get special effects, all right. So. Uh, so um, thank you for clicking on that. So what I, I thought I would lead off with is uh, this, is, uh, this is not shameless self-promotion. Uh, there is a reason why I'm showing you our website. Um, you can hit the accept button if you want to get rid of that. Thank you. This woman here, 
<laughs> this uh, woman here, when um, 72 years old, uh, you know, was told basically, uh, went to three or four centers, and uh, cancer was still not doing, it was spreading. And uh, came to our center, we did all the stuff with her, got her really strong. And then um, basically goes back home, and I'm, I, call, I call every single patient to talk with them. Uh, even to this day, I make a lot of phone calls. And uh, as I was talking to Marie, I say, Marie, what's going on? What are you doing? She goes, I'm pulling a log up a mountain. And I'm like, Marie, that's fucking cool. So I'm putting that on the website. So what you see achievement pulls logs up a mountain. Um, this is a woman that runs an entire farm by herself. And you know, like, you ever done something you feel proud of? Like, and I've, I've done a lot of stuff I feel proud of, but it's kind of like a fleeting moment because I'm thinking for the next thing. When I heard this woman is running a farm by herself, pulling logs up a mountain, I thought, man, I gotta try harder. I'm like, I'm not on her level, you know? Uh, I didn't beat cancer, I didn't do all those things that she's done, and so, you know, there's a lot of admiration there because here's a woman all by herself, no family, no friends to help her, and she did it. And so um, I, I share this with you because so many people come in to our center and uh, they say, well, I was exercising, I was doing yoga, I was doing whatever I was doing, and I still got cancer. And so they don't value exercise, and you know, you don't get credit for doing things wrong. You know, if I was, if you guys saw me back squatting and you see me twisting and I hurt a disc, I go, squats will kill you, don't do squats. You'd be like, well, Tom, you kind of did it the wrong way and that's why you got hurt. So a lot of people sometimes do something and don't take into account that maybe the way they were doing it was either incorrect or maybe in the world of fitness, there's a lot of exercise options and the one they chose is not optimal for their health. Next slide, please. So this um, next slide is, um, this is a woman, uh, well actually a family, she's 84 years old. And uh, by the way, I did, we, we work with men too, not just women, I just had uh, so these two pay, pay, patients were uh, women. So she has a very rare blood-based cancer. Um, was, when she came in, she could barely uh, stand. Um, two of her, is there any way to scroll up a little bit to see the rest of her? Thanks. So she could barely stand, she had her son and a daughter. So she has three daughters and a son, and they were helping her walk. And uh, today she's doing extremely well. The family was so happy with the results. They put a website up called Mom Gets Well. And uh, the family uh, tells me, Dr. Tom, Dr. Tom. I'm like, yes, They're like, your marketing is really poor. You need help. <laughs> I go, well. I appreciate that. You know, I am a scientist, and I'm not really a marketer, so I thank you for acknowledging that I don't know marketing, because I don't know if I would feel so good if I was a marketer. There's nothing wrong with marketing, but if you're a marketer, you should be good at marketing. If you're a scientist, be good at science, you know? So anyway, I thought it was really funny that they're like, we're going to help you, and they built this whole website and did all this stuff, and um, as it turns out, people that, you know, go to the site, they're like, oh, wow, you guys are cool. You could help this 84-year-old woman, you know? Now, I'm going to use this as a side tangent, share a couple stories about uh, the people I work with. So I have this woman come in in a wheelchair, and she's 70-something. Uh, she has a form of lymphoma that's spread around her body. Uh, she was a blood-based cancer. There are tumors starting to form, and she has ascites. So ascites is when there's all these proteins. The cancer spread to the liver is all these proteins and draws all this fluid. So you start to get like this distension in the abdomen. You can almost look like there's a basketball under your skin. And so when a woman's in a wheelchair, she's standing right here. And I'm like, Peggy, what's going on? She's like, oh, I let things go too far. I was like, well, Peggy, we're going to throw away the wheelchair. You're not going to have this as an option anymore. And Dr. Matt Zanis is walking by, and I go, and he's the guy that's going to help you. And I just turn around and walk away. <laughs> so right on the spot, poor, poor Matt. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what do I do? And, of course, Peggy is now walking. And she, of course, she does not have ascites anymore. Um, you know, one of the things, anybody that works for me, they'll know that I'm, I'm a fucking maniac. I push people hard. Uh, but I don't allow patients to lower expectations. My expectations are way harder than any patient that comes into our center because I know what the human body is capable of. I've been involved in testing maybe over 100,000 people now. Uh, I've been involved in measuring more different molecules and substances in the human body than any other person I've ever met. And so I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm always driving to do more and more and more because I'm driven by I don't know enough and I always think things could be better. And so because of those, you know, that's in my DNA. 
because of that pushing behind me. Um, that's what's driving, and that's why I drive the guys I work with pretty hard. And hopefully they say nice things about me when we're out socially. But uh, we're making some really cool strides uh, right now, and I'm really proud of everyone on the team. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I did not come here to talk about cancer, believe it or not, right, after all that. Um, I actually was uh, thinking about some stuff uh, maybe a month or two weeks ago. I was watching um, Ronnie Coleman, the King video on Netflix. And, uh, you know, I came from an era where, you know, it was bodybuilding and then powerlifting, Olympic lifting and strongman contests. And, you know, most of my friends were, you know, guys like Bill Kazmaier, Magnus Samuelson, Magnus for Magnuson, just freaks of nature that could literally lift anything. And I was uh, watching this video where Ronnie is, you know, one of the greatest bodybuilders in history. And now he's, uh, you know, bit can't walk. And so it made me think about, well, what would I have done if I was around to help Ronnie? Uh, I don't know him personally. I mean, we met a few times. I wouldn't say we're friends or anything. And so then uh, I wanted to share with you some, these are actual um, quotes. And I'll explain to them the significance afterwards. This first one is, nothing can be done to fix the extensive amount of damage you have. Next slide, please. You will never walk again. Uh, next slide. Uh, I have to keep reminding myself that this damage, all this damage, it's all from just one person. Anyone know uh, who they're talking about? Any slides? Any guesses? These are different, over almost 100 doctors. This slide's from an intern talking about me. Um, I had assigned projects to this intern to take all of my orthopedic data and put them in a spreadsheet. And he kept saying, are you sure this is one person? So um, I never thought about all the damage I had throughout my career as an athlete. There's a lot. I just kept telling myself, oh, I'm fine. And I just kept looking forward. I never looked backwards. So I was told um, in 2000, I was in a strongman contest, and a 1,200-pound tire fell on me sideways. So you don't have to be a doctor to know that when your knee joint is going this way and you're, you're facing this way, something's a little wrong. And so uh, uh, I went to uh, see a buddy of mine, an orthopedist in Florida. And they're like, Rob, what do you think? He's like, man, <laughs> this is a bad one. I was like, well, just assure me you'll do the best you can, and then I'll take it from there. So after he was done, uh, I was in a wheelchair, and uh, I started calling around, and I found a doctor from Hawaii, of all places. I'm like, what do I got to do to get your ass here? He's like, I don't even know you. Why would I go to Arizona? I was like, because we're going to do some shit that no one's ever done before. He's like, all right, let's do it. And so based on that simple rationale, this guy... <laughs> did hundreds of injections on my knee. And over the years, I probably had uh, maybe eight to 10 different stem cell therapy procedures done. Uh, I got a funny story about a doctor. I don't want to mention his name because I want to get him in trouble. But uh, I go to Florida, first time I'm meeting him, and I'm telling my ideas. I look at him, and he's scared. He's afraid. I'm like, why? What's the matter? He goes, I might get into trouble. I was like, no, you won't get into trouble. He goes, how? How come? He goes, because no one's going to know. I'm not telling anybody. So. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> so he had, uh, he had this thing about, he had this fear about growth hormone. And he wanted to give me like 0 0.02, you know, micrograms. I'm like, dude, that will not even help an ant. So why don't you step out of the room and let me handle it from here? So he, uh, so he's like, I don't know, I don't know. And I said, look, let me make this simple. I'm not the guy you hold back on. I'm the guy you build your career on. When I leave here and everybody sees this fucker is walking better, they're all going to be coming to you because they knew how I was before. So he leaves the room, and I get his assistant, and I'm like, I want that vial, I want that vial, that vial. So Maggie's got like the sterile tray, there's like a few tubes. Now he comes back, there's like six tubes, they're all maxed out. He's like, wow, that's quite a bit of volume. And I was like, ah, don't worry about it. And so anyway. Um, we definitely pushed some boundaries over the years, is what I'm saying. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is us talking about Ronnie Coleman. Um, just, uh, it's worth watching the, the Netflix. I mean, if you have a Netflix you know, membership, uh, you can see it. He's got a lot of compression issues, a lot of disc degeneration issues. Um, but, you know, he was a guy that was freakishly strong for a bodybuilder. And it was sad to see him, you know, uh, you know that incapacitated. What I was impressed with is the way he, he maintained a positive mindset. Uh, this guy ran a business, was still a husband, still a dad, 
and still worked out every day, even though he was losing the ability to walk and he had so much pain, he couldn't feel his legs from like the waist down. And I thought that's pretty cool. Um, not that he was suffering, but it was pretty cool that he did not let that obstacle hold him back. He continued to move forward. Next slide, please. So um, I thought, you know, all right, let's set up a goal. If I was going to work with Ronnie, what would I have done differently? And so just, uh, I want to make sure everybody's on the same. Uh, we could do this right now, if anyone here, we can do this. So reduce excessive damage from training. You know, I came from a world or a culture where it was like, you know, no pain, no gain. So if you did seven reps, I had to do eight reps, and the next guy had to do nine reps. You know, we would always try to psych each other out mentally, and physically, we were willing to win at all costs. So if it meant I might tear something, but I beat you, that was okay because I beat you. Even when it was like, you know, in a gym. There's no trophies for beating someone in a gym, right? But it was, it was the mindset. And so I'll, I'll introduce some uh, things here that uh, in 2002, I was um, uh, working out in a gym with some coaches, and one of them uh, challenged me to see who could deadlift the most uh, deadlift 500 pounds, but cold. You have to walk up to the bar and just start ripping it and pulling it. And the thing about it is I was way stronger than the, the coach was, but the coach had way better mobility than I did. Like, I can't touch the ground right now, right? And that's how I start when I'm warming up. So imagine now if I can't even get to the bar, you know, how am I going to pull 500 pounds more than this guy? So, of course, me being the Neanderthal that I am, I accept the challenge. And so... Uh, he goes first, he pulls it like three times. I'm like, five and two pounds, three times, that's nothing. So of course I go, and I can't reach the bar. So I have to go one end, lift it this way, go to the other end, lift it this way. So I'm like kayaking with 500 pounds right now. And so I beat him. Um, but at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a certain point, um, though, around the third rep, there's a loud popping noise, and the coach is like, dude, put it down. I'm like. I'm already hurt. Might as well get something out of this. So I just keep going. Got about 10 reps, you know, and I felt like the winner for about two seconds. And as I put the weight down and turn around, I, I feel pain going in every direction in my body. I couldn't really tell you what was damaged. I just know there was a lot of damage. And so it took about six months to come back, and the estimates are herniated somewhere around three discs. When I, when I saw my, my buddies, orthopedists, and the MRIs, they said, there's so many herniations here over time. We don't know what's new, what's old, what's a re-injury. There's just you know, stuff all over this, this back. So anyway, it took about six months to come back from that before I could deadlift something. And then it was um, in 2010, I was working out in the gym, and someone dropped some water behind me, and it was like enough of a slope that as the water came down my right uh, side. Um, as I was extending, my foot slipped, and so I rotated with this weight. And so uh, it took three weeks. So I was 585, and it took three weeks later, I was pulling 635 pain-free. So in 10 years, we learned enough about how to handle disc herniations that it went from six months to three weeks. And then last year, um, I don't know what the hell I was doing. I was, this is embarrassing, but I'm going to be truthful. I was getting out of my car. I was not lifting. <laughs> And bing, something happens, and I'm paralyzed. I can't get to the curb, which is like three feet away, four feet away. And I had these two young guys coming in uh, that I was supposed to work out with, and I can't move. So I get all the gadgets I'm going to show you. I run this shit 24 hours a day. And a few days later, I crushed them in the gym with no issues. So in less than two or three days, I was able to get full pain-free range of motion. But remember, my, my full range of motion ain't far. So... <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so this was uh, when I first came here. Um, if I'm working, I'm doing therapy. I don't waste my time just working without actually doing something therapeutic for my body. This is a laser system that I had a, a buddy of mine's an engineer. Um, he started out actually in music. And then one day he started seeing laser systems. And like, man, these laser systems are all wrong, the way they're, way they're approaching it. So what you can't see is um, the different pads I have underneath my pants but I was glowing like a Christmas tree in the, in the back green room here uh, while I was doing some work. So next slide, please. And so what I wanted people to see is um, how do we integrate this with training in the gym right now? So these are basically, um, these are very expensive LEDs. They're like the best that money could buy. They're pulling these solid blocks. So this piece here is, is rigid. It's not flexible. 
And what we were finding is like, how are we gonna put this in different, you know, if your joints are not perfectly square, rectangular, they're, they're conical shape. Some of you guys with big muscles, they're maybe like a circular shape. And so we have um, a flexible pad on the back so we could wrap things around. And then there's Velcro on either end. So what I have here is three of these, let's say, uh, arrays that the Velcro would attach. And it's not so obvious from the slide. They run a big power lifting belt. And then you have the controls right there. And next slide. And that's, so this is, um, so that's when it was off. So just, just so you could see, um, you're not going to be able to buy stuff with this much power. Um, so we, we were looking at different gadgets to market, and like, oh, this shit's too weak. We're going to have to make shit that's at the level we want it to be. So next slide. And so now what you'll see is, um, see now you have the belt has actual laser in it. So now as you're working out, you're doing therapy while you're training because it minimizes post-exercise inflammation and damage. Um, so I just did that. Uh, eventually what I plan on doing is um, I want to take uh, these powerlifting belts and want to develop a cartridge-based system so that we could put in uh, different things like vibration, light, magnetic field, so that you could do different therapies based on what it is that you want to accomplish. Rule of thumb, generally speaking, if you look at all the research globally, magnetic field therapies or pulse electromagnetic field therapies, you look at light, LED, laser, low level laser therapy, photobiomodulation, all that kind of stuff. So like the light world and the magnetic field world. Generally speaking, magnetic field systems are better for mobility and movement, and light is better for pain. That's like the summary of everything. Lots of discrepancies in the studies, lots of different findings, but I just simplified it there. Now, when you work with actual people one at a time, some people will say, hey, I feel less pain after magnetic field therapy, and other people say, I feel more range of motion. And you know, that's just individual variability. Um, so our goal is to have all the resources and tools necessary to help anyone that walks through the door, because if they don't respond to one device, we can now try a different device. And so it frees us up in our center. We're not married to te a given technology. We're not married to a given supplement or device. Because if, if one doesn't work, we're going to try something else. Next slide, please. OK, so next we're going to play some videos. And um, I wanted people to see, uh, so we have a gym. We have a bunch of medical offices. And we took all this uh, medical equipment, and we actually put it in the gym. So if you go into our gym, you see all these like massage tables or exam tables, and there's all kinds of gadgets on them. Uh, we're moving to the point where while people are exercising, we're going to be putting them in a magnetic field, we're going to be doing intravenous therapies, and, and just things that are way beyond you know, what most people have considered. So uh, Dr. Matt is in the front row, torn medial meniscus, and uh, he's, just, he's, just, he's taking a measurement of flexion in the knee right now. Uh, it's 110 degrees is what it shows, and he's just showing you he's got a goniometer, how he's taking the angle, and then right now, um, looking at about after that, then yeah, go to the next video. 110 degrees. So he's setting this up here, and what I want people to see is these are this is a, a device called um, Pulse XL Pro, and it's a very very powerful magnetic field machine. It's almost powerful that money to buy. Um, you don't need the sound or whatever if they want to. Thanks. And then what he's just doing is setting up the pads on either side of the joint. And the main point I'd like everyone to get out of this is um, normally, how would you fix something on the inside? I mean, historically, it would be surgery, right? It's hard to get inside of something. What's really cool about these technologies now is you could be doing therapy on the inside of the joint while you're actually moving. And the movement now, not only is it pain-free, but allows you to focus on the quality of movement. So, you know, back in my day, if you locked out a weight, you locked out a weight. It didn't matter if it was ugly and you still made it, you locked it out. Today, we've learned a little bit. We say, you know what? Let's focus a little bit more on quality. Let's just not get it up at all costs. Let's actually get it there with a little bit more precision and neuromuscular control. So he's, he's demonstrating how he's setting everything up. That's like a slide disc, you know, basically a Frisbee on, on artificial turf. And he's going to crank it up. And then you're going to see he's going to do, uh, he's going to grab his blue cable and do, let's say, 10 heel slides, right, to work on his range of motion. I wish we had a timer, but essentially it's 10 reps. And I don't know, three minutes, five minutes, how long would you say it took to do the 10 reps? Oh, not very long at all. Maybe like a minute or two. Yeah, so a minute or two, 
right? I'll just, you could just show one and then we'll go to the next video. If you see one, you know what the rest look like. And I want you just to see is that he's gonna work on uh, flexion and extension of the knee. Now remember, this is a torn medial meniscus. So that's the piece on the inside of his knee between the bones. I am not voluntarily having my foot like that. Yeah. yeah. So the magnetic field is so powerful, it's stimulating neuromuscular contractions. So, you know, like when a magnetic field hits a wire, it can generate electricity. So think of it as, as a magnetic field is hitting a motor unit, it's generating contractions of the muscles. So he's working on extension, then he'll do some reps to work on his flexion. And so he'll do that 10 times in the next video, please. Now, right after that, he's now gonna do another angle, and it was about 132 degrees. So 22 degrees improvement in range of motion, pain-free, no drugs, no supplements, and that's just one session. Right, so now if we did this stuff, you know, several times a day, um, we've got a lot of different gadgets. We have thousands of options for people there, but we have, um, we've had people post hip replacement, um, and we did uh, another technology using uh, an electrical stimulation, and they were walking without uh, any devices within a few days. Um, I have, uh, when I tore my medial meniscus, um, I used a laser and electrical stimulation and had full range of motion one day. Uh, I was texting these guys at like midnight, <laughs> doing my therapy, and they're getting a barrage of text messages, probably wondering what idiot is emailing me or texting me at midnight. Um, next slide, please. So now I want, to see, I want you guys to see application. So assuming this is a different uh, model. Uh, there's another guy who works with us, Josh. But I wanted you to see we could put the pads or the paddles on outside of the knee while he's doing squats. So if you had some arthritis in the knee, you could actually be doing therapy while you're training. So this is just more for, you know, he has nothing wrong with his knees, but I just wanted you guys to get an idea of what could be done. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a now a reverse hyperextension. So what we did is we took two square pads. We have one in the front of them, one in the back of them. We create a direction for the magnetic field. So basically, he's doing reverse hypers. With what, what his spine is in a magnetic field. This is the kind of stuff like I would have done with Ronnie or anyone else, any type of back issues. Uh, and, and I can tell you that, man, it makes a big impact right away. Uh, next video, please. Uh, now, this is Bryce, strength coach. Um, Bryce was behaving badly, so I decided we would torture him and hang him upside down. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I apologize, I didn't realize this would be X-rated. Bryce has no clothes. Yeah. So uh, essentially what he's doing, um, he's hanging you know, on an inversion table, and the rationale behind it is some traction, and we have a magnetic field going through in between um, the vertebral bodies and the vertebral discs. The rationale behind that is that the magnetic field would help cerebral spinal fluid and other fluids bathe the surface area. So normally when you're loaded, you push out all the nutrition, the liquid in your spine, it gets pushed out. So we're, we're talking to people about you know, moving more and stuff. Well, the problem now is you're always loading and then you, you create areas of the body where there's not enough nutrition getting to it over time. So these types of technologies, we're basically adding magnetic field He's using his hands to have a pivot point, and he's gonna move his hips around as wide a circle as he can, giving limitations of the frame. And, and we're holding the pads, so actually two other guys are holding the pads while he's moving his hips around a circle. I could tell you that um, for people that are, that are quote unquote bone on bone in their hips or their knees, these types of therapies make a huge difference. Again, pain free, no drugs, no supplements. So these types of things are sustainable for most people because it's not an ongoing expense and have forever. Next uh, video, please. And this is a uh, same technology, but now applied to doing like an RDL or a deadlift. So this was, uh, so uh, Dr. Matt had just done the slides, you know, for his meniscus stuff, and now we're just demonstrating. Um, he can lift more than 95 pounds. I just want you guys to know that. Uh, just have him uh, demonstrating this only. <laughs> so the idea is we could put the part of the body in a magnetic field that we want. And um, what's interesting is you could take a very arthritic joint or a joint that hurts. People say, man, I can't move this joint by putting it in the field and now moving it pain-free. So the idea is uh, the reason why we want 
the movement, by the way, is we want to help the tissue to remodel in a healthy way. Uh, what happens a lot of times, um, more athletic people, when they get injured, they keep forcing it, and they're not realizing that if there was a, if I had a high-speed video camera and I was studying their movement, you know, you would see like these micro perturbations all the way through. It's not like a smooth stroke. And so those micro perturbations as they're lifting, that results in the surfaces of the joint healing unevenly, right? Or, or creating more bone spurs, things that you don't want to have happen. And by doing these types of uh, strategies, it's another dimension of uh, like increasing the challenge of the movement. So we could do it at a low level and facilitate the execution of the movement, or we could do it at a much more intense level and make it so like it's rocking you and making it harder to do it. So it requires greater neuromuscular control and coordination to do these things. Um, is that the last one? Cool. So um, uh, some things I'll share with you. So um, I didn't know uh, how many questions there would be, so I wanted to allow for some of that. But recently, um, we've tested a number of uh, technologies one in particular is uh, ozone steam sauna therapy, and we've been able to show that we've increased um, testosterone 70% and growth hormone 6,000% without supplements or drugs. Oh, that's uh, one of my podcast shows. So they were trying to capture that on part caveman and part scientist, so they got me with a dumbbell and me with a clipboard. I hope it captures that correctly. And there's, uh, there's another one, um, the... Uh, Next slide would be to ask Dr. Tom. So uh, when, when this slide came out, everyone started questioning my sexual orientation because of all the purple. Um, I'm a family guy, I have a woman, so I'll just put that out there. So, <laughs> so yeah. And then uh, Carzenta.com, we have a form. Anyone could sign up for anything. Uh, we do free consults. Our philosophy is when people come to the center, they get a free tour to get to try any of the gadgets we have uh, one time for free because I don't think you should pay for something if it doesn't help you. So we have people try stuff and it's funny because one guy will be like, he'll try this, he goes, this is it, this is it. And the next guy uses it, feels it's nothing and he goes, no, this is it over here. So it's kind of funny watching that. Um, so uh, I don't have a timer and that, by the way, I never set the watch. Okay. I have a nice collection of watches. I've never set the time on any of them. Okay. Very, very subtle. They're also, check, check. You got me? Very subtle watches, as you yeah. can tell. Like a shirt. Uh, yeah. So we do have a question over here, MCK. Yeah. Uh, Tom, just a quick one. Um, are you using this so uh, preventative or as treatment for injury? Like, are you using it pre-injury? Do you have a game plan for that? Is there well, so most people coming to us are, are pretty damaged. So, well, they won't hear the question, I guess, so we use it preventively or for therapeutically. And so uh, in terms of the, what I showed here, you know, most of the people, unfortunately, wait too long to come to us. So maybe the people working at the center can use it preventively, but most other people, they already have an injury or something by the time they come in. Um, but if I could, I would definitely use it preventatively. I don't always have that option, though. Yeah, I don't care. I'm going to ask one. Um, so you're using these therapies, but they're not correcting structural damage. They're just removing pain. So, I, so uh, Is it not good, that simple? No, it's a good distinction, though. So um, first thing, I guess, uh, uh, it opens up. This opens up a big can of worms. Okay. okay. So everyone treats pain like it's a location. Where is pain stored? It's processed in the nervous system, right? It's not just the brain, it's the entire nervous system. Um, most of orthopedics is following stuff from the 1700s, today, 1700s. Most uh, places ignore data from about 1993 on, which starts to talk about neuromatrix theory and how there's different parts of the nervous system interpreting pain um, or processing it. So where you feel the pain doesn't necessarily mean that's where the problem is, but it does raise the issue, why is the nervous system prioritizing that area? And this is where you find some hokey things. When we actually test people, we fix an ankle, an elbow gets better. You know, we fix a knee, and a shoulder gets better. So it's, you know, um, 
to the best of our knowledge, we're interpreting this as there's been compensation patterns within the nervous system, uh, but we could be wrong, right? There could be new findings and other stuff coming out. Um, what most people will do is they'll say, oh, my elbow hurts, get an x-ray, get an MRI, they see structural damage, and I go, well, the reason I have that pain is because of the damage I see off the MRI. The problem with that approach is half the time it's wrong. If we were to take 1,000 people and MRI them, lots of people with herniated discs have no pain. Lots of people with bone spurs have no dysfunction. Um, so there's a standard test called Romberg's test. And so I'm showing you something. I'm missing body parts in my knee. So I have no medial meniscus in either knee. And so um, when people come in, we'll have them do this test. And they'll go, oh, I, I can't do this test because of the surgery or because of this other reason. OK. Well, then I shouldn't be able to do it either, right, if I'm missing body parts. You can do things that, uh, because of the synaptic plasticity of the entire nervous system, there are change adaptations that can take place in milliseconds to seconds that allow us to do way more than what we think we're capable of. So, but in terms of now, acutely, the therapies I showed you would be more pain management, and you might just say getting rid of inflammation or something, Chronically, over time, it's my belief that you will, remo you will remodel the tissue in a healthy way. The problem with that is uh, most people, once they're pain-free, they stop coming, right, because they don't justify the necessity of continuing to do the therapy. So it could be, you know, remodeling, but I don't think it's going to happen for Thanks. most people. Sorry, I didn't mean to be too long-winded there. Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite color? <laughs> Ant, sorry about that, bud. Hi, Dr. Tom. Anthony Lowe. Um, would love to speak to you after. Sure. I was going to ask what the proposed mechanisms of the light therapy and the magnetic therapy are and whether you think they're neurological or not. It sounds like you think that it's a combination of the biological effect at the joint as well as the neurological effect systemically. So for light, uh, I'll keep the answer somewhat simple so everyone can get out of here on time today. <laughs> so for light, primary, most of the research looks at light activating an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase C, which is part of the electron transport chain. So based on that, you would say, well, light increases ATP. That's going to be the final component of that chain. So you don't, it doesn't necessarily tie right into pain and inflammation directly. But one of the consequences of activating that enzyme is increases microcirculation. Well, now if you wash away a fatigue metabolite, you could perform more reps, right, if you're not as fatigued locally. If you wash away an inflammatory metabolite, well, now you have less pain. And one of the things that has been um, shown is that light also increases local production of adenosine. So if you used acupuncture points, and you did needles, like a needle-based acupuncture here, and in here you do the exact same points, but just light going to the point. So there's nothing physically penetrating the skin. There's better results in terms of reduction in pain from light-based acupuncture than the actual needle going in the skin, or through the skin. So, and the reason is there's increased production of adenosine. So I would say that uh, on a, in, a, in the light world, there's probably a lot of things going on, but most of the attention right now is the activation of the enzyme, the ATP production, and the, activate, uh, the increased production of adenosine. Now, in a magnetic field, that starts getting into a lot of, um, I would say, hokey areas of physics and biophysics, where there's a lot of conceptual leaps. But generally speaking, you would say it reduces inflammatory markers, although most of the data, they didn't measure any inflammatory markers. And you know, a lot of these gadgets, which you have to keep in mind, the, the research designs were very poorly done. It was something like this. Ask a subject to do something, <clears throat> subject does something, and they go, I'm pain free. And then the, the, you know, the doctors from Germany and Russia go, see, it reduced inflammation. They didn't measure the inflammation, they don't know. They just ask the guy how he feels, he feels good, and they use that visual bias you know, reporting to say what happened. So the data wasn't very mechanistic. Um, and some of the more contemporary work, the, the start process is that the magnetic field is hitting a voltage block. And that voltage block, over time, the atoms of the structures rearrange. 
and now the field passes through it. As it turns out, the, myo, the proteins, whether it's collagen uh, proteins or some other proteins, they go from being disorganized to structurally organized. But there, there's lots of opportunity for growth in interpreting that data. So I hope that was somewhat satisfactory. Uh, good morning. My day job is running an internal medicine clinic, and we're trying to reduce the amount of narcotics we're giving to our patients because they're all elderly, and a lot of their musculoskeletal injuries for 30 years have been treated with Vicodin and Percocet and morphine. How long do the therapies that you're using last? Because one of our biggest issues is getting them to come back and take time off of work, and mm -hmm. you know they start to feed their families, but they need to be in the hospital getting treated. So is the therapies you're working towards a more long-term solution so they come back less? Yeah, so we don't, I mean, for the most part, we've almost eliminated meds for pain, you know? So I can't say 100%. I, I, you know, normally what happens is someone first comes in, if they're on codeine or morphine or something else, we don't instantly take them off of it. The doctors will figure out a way to titrate that over time. Um, and, you know, in terms of these therapies, the more they're used, um, I guess one th distinction I want to make sure is clear, uh, the model isn't just throw them on a bed and walk away. You know, the model is they're doing a the therapy and they're learning how to move. The nervous system has to see an increasing array of movement patterns. So if I just, at the end of every day, if I just sit, I teach my nervous system that sitting is normal. And now when I try to move, man, I'm stiff and it's hard, it's difficult. And there's all kinds of data from different groups looking at changes in vestibular cochlear apparatus, you can think of it as inner ear, changes in optic nerve, um, breathing, all these things have impact on global postural tone. So it's kind of like the less I use these peripheral systems, the more inhibition I get, then the more pain. The three things that are consequence of lack of movement over time, increased perception of pain. So stupid people will say, I could handle a lot of pain. Why do I say that? Because healthy brains know how to get out of pain. They don't keep putting up with something that isn't working. And so what do most people say? Oh, I could handle pain. That means you're doing something wrong because eventually the inflammasome production, the other signals from the body, they crank up the volume. Doesn't matter how strong you are, doesn't matter how weak you are, it's independent of strength and other performance measures. It's that these things go up and eventually you have to succumb to it. So in terms of the timeline, what I would say is um, the more they do uh, in terms of uh, frequency, not duration. So I think 10 treatments a day would actually be better than one long treatment per day, but that is challenging. So what we would do is, uh, teach people movements to do. So we have them do, they do movements in the magnetic field, they learn how to do these exercises and go home and do it on their own. And then there could be a program that's set up, if you do the exercises, you know, there's some reward or incentive, but the goal is to get them off those meds because uh, those types of meds will independently allow inflammasome production to continue to go up so they will feel more pain over time, independent of any damage to the structures. And we could chat more afterwards if you like. Any other questions? I've got one back here, Kelly. Uh, my name is Paul Yanzer. My background's in chemistry and physics. I've spent a fair amount of time studying the therapies that you're using, and uh, I think they're really powerful tools. Um, I've been wondering recently, uh, considering the wavelengths coming out of the sun being predominantly red and infrared, if we could recreate um, some of the therapeutic effects that you see using uh, LED red light therapy or even utilizing earth grounding uh, to access the magnetic field of the earth, uh, maybe even take training outside, um, and recreate some of these, these therapies to reduce inflammation, um, increase mitochondrial function. Um, so I was wondering what your thoughts are, are on that, more as a, a preventative as opposed to a therapeutic. Cool. Uh, so science has a wonderful habit of taking nature, separating it all apart, then discovering nature knew what it was doing, and then putting it back together to reproduce nature. That pretty much summarizes all science. Um, you know, for years, 
it doesn't really matter what, where you go, but it's kind of like this. Um, you know, from your toenail to your hair, it's all connected. It's one organism. But for a long time, people would say, you know, when I have problems with my digestive tract, I get more anxious. And psychiatrists would say, there's no research on that. And lo and behold, the gut-brain axis is related relationship is discussed. And now everybody goes, oh, yeah, when you have GI issues, it could affect your anxiety. And in terms of, um, I think there is definitely something to connecting us to nature, whether it's through grounding. So grounding would be something like um, I have a sheet on my bed, and there's wires connecting to a copper rod in the ground. And the idea is I'm leveraging the magnetic field from the Earth's crust around my body. The, the difficulty is a lot of the data that's done on that, it's kind of weak, you know? And the problem is, if it works, it's not um, useful enough to make you know, millions or billions of dollars, so the financial incentives aren't really there to study that stuff. And if it doesn't work, you know, it's, um, what's gonna happen is it gets killed off. And, and I'll give you maybe a good example. Years ago, there was about $250 million invested in looking at ozone and light-based therapies and heat. So heat, ozone, and light. And they found all these diseases that could be treated successfully for you know, maybe a couple of hundred bucks or less. And so the, the company funding all this was looking at a way of uh, how am I gonna like, mass produce something and figure out how they're gonna make money off of it. They made the mistake of picking a cardiovascular disease. And the problem with cardiovascular disease is when you have an issue, you stop moving. And now you have atrophy and loss of function. Now even if you treat the heart or the cardiovascular issue, the rest of their body did it magically you know, improve. So their strategy for researching wasn't a really a good one you know, because they didn't allow for the dysfunction that took place over time. And um, I would say that uh, uh, a lot of what we're doing now is kind of trying to better understand nature because we think nature has all the answers already. We just don't know what those answers are. So I can't specifically say anything to answer what you said, but I, I think it's definitely the way to go. Um, uh, and hopefully that'll satisfy some of their curiosity. Thank you, sir. Hey, this is Brad Snyder. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in what you have to say about these EMR technologies being utilized for different kinds of therapies. I wonder if you could offer some, you probably, the, maybe there's data, maybe there's a hypothesis about unintended side effects. I think it sounds pretty safe when you're putting uh, magnetic fields through knees and elbows and things like that. What if you're shooting fields through the core? Are there any, is there any science or anything you can offer as far as maybe the danger of putting fields through the core, or is that pretty safe? So um, there's always potential for side effects, you know, but I would argue that um, people that are worried about side effects then don't leave your house, you know, don't fight, you know, MMA. Um, I was a scientific advisor to Olympic Committee and to um, NCAA, and they would say, we're worried about safety. I'm like, this guy's punching this guy in the head. How the hell is that safe? Like, what, what, how do you define safety? We have race car drivers flying around a track so fast in milliseconds, if they make a mistake, they're dead. You wipe into a wall. You know, yeah, some guys might make it, but most guys ain't. That's not safety. So what, what people confuse a lot of times is uh, comfort versus safety. If you're really worried about safety, then you don't redesign you know, things to perform better that would increase risk. You would, um, you know, everyone would be pedaling, well, let's say like Tour de France. They should be on the same bicycles from the very first time a man rode a bicycle, not going on bicycles that are re-engineered to go faster than ever. But in terms of specifics about uh, these therapies, uh, they've been used for a long time. This is not something really new. This is stuff that has, uh, I would say, 50 years or more behind it. And uh, the, the stuff that we demonstrated when um, we create what's called sandwiches all the time, where we have the heart, we have you know, vital organs in a magnetic field. And uh, just to maybe give think, people a better perspective of safety is the FDA has recently approved uh, phase two investigations for using magnetic fields to treat cancer. So there's, um, there's a lot of potential there, 
but it's getting to some very, very specific details about frequency, time, and intensity. But it, I would say they're pretty safe. We got time for one more in the back. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, taking it back to the beginning, uh, we've been discussing a lot of joints, you know, elbows, knees, backs, things of that nature, and magnets and light therapy, things of that. But bringing it back to the very beginning with your uh, examples of the uh, cancer patients. Are these the same technologies, or can you give us a few examples? I'm sure there's not a one-size-fits-all, but... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not quite clear on the question. What is it? I'm sorry, uh, with the cancer patients that you were working, or mentioning at the very beginning, what types of therapies were those? Were those still the light and magnets, or what were yeah. you addressing those? So, so, okay, thank you for clarifying. So we use the same stuff. Um, you know, the application would be different, but a lot of stuff we use the same. One thing I'll say about light and cancer is that uh, our intention for using light therapies with cancer patients really is to destroy cancer cells. But there is no real-time data analytics. Um, I was discussing with someone this morning, one of my ambitions is uh, I took uh, technology from orthopedic medicine so we can put a camera in your knee joint and we can get a 4K HD resolution, way better details than any MRI. And then it's a, why isn't anyone putting a camera in a tumor? Why don't we throw some shit in a tumor and actually see what the cancer cells look like, get the cancer cells killed, and do they grow back? Why, don't, why is anyone doing that? Fear. They're worried about, oh, if I penetrate the tumor, it's going to spread. It's like, well, that's a justifiable concern, except that it's already spreading. So you're going to use fear of it spreading to limit your thinking against a disease that's already spreading all over the body. That, that, then I would say, well, that's kind of dumb. Because um, if the treatment works, then you want it to basically spread around the body so you can kill everything off faster. And the treatments aren't working as it is. So to say I won't try something new, you know, too fear limited. Um, the goal with light with cancer cells is to have a substance taken up by the cancer cell. That substance would be defined as a photosensitizing agent. And what we do right now is we match the wavelength of light with the energetics of the substance. So by the right wavelength, and the right atomic mass, it stimulates that substance to become the equivalent of a grenade inside the cancer cell. So we call that um, photodynamic therapy. So curcumin would be one example. We use a blue wavelength of light with curcumin. So you take curcumin, it gets in your cancer cells. In theory, there's no technology to measure it in vivo right now, meaning inside the person. So curcumin's, let's say, in cancer cells in my body. And now I would put a blue wavelength of light in my vein and every time a cancer cell gets into that field, that, that, uh, that hit that wavelength, it'll get ex it excites the, the curcumin and blows up the cancer cell from within. Um, may I share one more quick story? You Luke? may. All right, so, um, <laughs> so what, since you asked the last question about cancer, you know, cancer, there's so much fear behind it that people forget to think. And, and uh, anyone here that runs their own business you know, if you try to advertising, marketing strategy, and you put X dollars, you run this campaign, it fails. You go, that didn't work, we gotta change what we're doing. And then you try something else, that didn't work, gotta change what you're doing. But you learn, if you pay attention, have metrics of monitoring what you're doing, failure is actually beneficial because it quickly helps you to get to something that's quote unquote right. And with disease, a lot of times, people come in patient-wise and they think, well, you had success here, so I'm going to walk through the door, and magically, you're going to know exactly what to do to help me. And that's not usually how it goes. Usually the way it works is you try something uh, in terms of fighting cancer, and it doesn't work. But now people get afraid. Oh, my God, it didn't work. Well, I don't know what the, hell the cancer cells in your body are doing yet. we got to take time to study them and monitor them. So I had um, uh, a situation where we had one of the rarest forms of um, AML. So it's, uh, it's a blood cancer. And his family came in, and uh, they said, uh, it's a sister and a brother. And she says, brother, my brother's going to die. Everybody said, there's nothing that can be done to help him. I said, well, you know, we're going to try our best. We'll see what we can do. Because we can't promise someone a cure. We can't promise them a result, because we don't know anything about the individual we're helping yet. So uh, I said, let's see what happens. So we tried something. It did not work. We made some changes. Second thing we tried, did not work. Made some more changes. Three, uh, three different you know, strategies did not work. Tried a fourth thing, did not work. Fifth thing, 
did not work. So five different strategies, zero success. So failure, failure, failure. So families crying, it's a Saturday. And most people that know me know I actually give a shit. So our clinic's closed. I fly in our oncologist from another state. I open up the clinic on a Saturday, or maybe it was a Sunday. I, I work every day, so I have no idea what day it is sometimes. So we, we open up the clinic, and they're crying, like, hey, my brother's going to die. Nothing's working. I'm like, well, nothing before worked, and, but now we have data. And so we're going to make some changes, and let's see what happens. We make two very, very minor adjustments. The next day, a 70% improvement, and the cancer's reduced in his blood. So now the family goes from crying hysterical, my brother's not going to make it, to less than 24 hours, they're kicking the heels and ready to pop champagne bottles because of, and so what, what I want people to take away from this is that it doesn't always work right away, but you gather data that helps you make a better decision. And if you monitor people and you give a shit, you don't keep doing what doesn't work, you actually change what you're doing and that's how you get to where you want to be. So hopefully that ended on a positive note for everyone. That the guy is still alive today, by the way. Um. Dr. Tom, everybody.